So Clay Flanagan is the manager of robotics and automation engineering section at Southwest Research Institute. His talk's going to be on industrial robotics, recent advance and advancements in sensing, software, mobility, and safety that are driving innovation. Clay supervises a group at Southwest Research Institute that focuses on transitioning basic research to real-world automation solutions for industrial systems. His areas of expertise include sensing and perception, machine learning, robotic manipulation, and mobility. Clay is involved in programs that include self-driving vehicles, some of the largest robots in the world, and robotic systems that are able to adapt to dynamic environments. He has a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and over 15 years experience in developing automated solutions. One of Clay's group's primary focuses is on advanced technologies for industrial robotics and automation. His talk will be centered around recent advancements in this area as they might relate to drilling technologies. Clay, all yours. All right, thank you, John. So as John mentioned, I'm a manager of robotics and automation at Southwest Research Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Institute, we are a nonprofit applied research and development organization located in San Antonio, Texas on 1,500 acres. We have about 3,000 staff, do about a half billion dollars worth of research and development every year. And we focus on pro providing contract research and development, engineering and testing services for a wide range of, of industries and organizations, both government and commercial. We're a pretty diverse organization of 11 different technical divisions addressing many different types of technical needs. And we do robotics in a lot of those areas. So as a little bit of background, I'd like to just give you a, uh, sort of a sampling of some of the work that we've accomplished in the last few years. My group uh, developed some very large robotic systems. This is a picture of one that we just deployed for Hill Air Force Base. Uh, it's a very large dual robot system used to remove coatings from aerospace applications, in this case uh, F-22 uh, aircraft. Some of the largest robotic systems in the world, um, all custom designed by us. So we do all the controls, all the mechanics, all the software for them, and then support them in the field. This was an interesting program. A program we were involved with is NASA funded. Um, and the goal of this program was to uh, search for life in underwater environments. So the aspirations here on this program were towards uh, development of technologies that could be used to explore one of the moons of Jupiter, uh, which is thought to have an ice shell with water underneath. And just as on Earth, anywhere where there's water, there's life, the planetary scientists are very interested in trying to explore that environment. So this program was uh, involved in developing technologies to autonomously search those underwater environments. Obviously, we did this here on Earth, uh, but we did explore some uh, previously unexplored uh, caves in Mexico, mapped them out, and actually found some new life forms. We also do a lot of uh, unmanned ground vehicle research at Southwest Research. Uh, this is a picture of our MARTI vehicle. MARTI stands for Mobile Autonomous Robotics Technology Initiative. It's a multi-year, multi-million dollar program focused on developing technologies for unmanned systems. So uh, the DOD and the military have a lot of applications in this area for things like logistics and resupply. And there's commercial applications too for things like active safety systems um, and com uh, communication between vehicles, communications with infrastructure and roadways. So a very diverse uh, uh, group of uh, robotics programs uh, kind of mirrors the diversity at the Institute. So my, my particular group does a lot of work in industrial and manufacturing environments. And this picture at the top here is kind of what everybody thinks of when you think of industrial robots. It's a, a paint shop from an automotive line and has been one of the major drivers in industrial robotics for decades now. It was really in the 80s and the 90s that was the heyday of, uh, in, in terms of growth of the industrial robotics uh, industry. But since then, a lot of things have sort of stagnated there. There's been incremental improvements, but we haven't seen real disruptive change in the industrial robotics world since that time. 
So today I'm going to talk about uh, four different areas where there is some really exciting changes going on that I think are going to make um, some of these sort of future visions of uh, Rosie the Robot a possibility in the new, near future. So specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about sensors, software systems, mobility, and then safety and regulations, and how those are uh, impacting the industrial and commercial robotics industry. So first up, sensing systems. So traditionally, um, when, when you have an industrial robotic system, you need some form of sensor that is used to provide guidance for that robot. So in this picture here, you can see the robot is picking up muffins from one conveyor, putting them into a case in another. Very classic uh, application of industrial robotics. That's typically solved by a 2D vision solution or machine vision, computer vision. So you've got a camera installed on the system looking at the muffins coming down the conveyor. And um, as long as the muffins are well behaved, i.e. the top side is up and the bottom side is down, this solution works pretty well. It's a planar solution though, right? It's a two degree of freedom problem. You really only have to figure out where those muffins are in an XY sense. Um, and that was kind of the state of things through really the late 80s through the 90s and even up until now. But when you start thinking about trying to do more interesting things in natural or complex environments, you really need to start thinking in a 3D sense. So roboticists have been exploring 3D sensing as a, as a field for a long time, and there's a number of approaches to accomplish that from a hardware perspective. So on the top there, you can see a picture of a, um, a stereo vision camera. It's basically got two cameras, just like human eyes provide a, a sense of depth for us. You can do the same thing for a robot by using two cameras and correlating the two images. Um, and that gives you some uh, sense of, of depth or 3D vision. Here in the middle is a, is a picture of a structured light solution. So that's very similar to, to uh, stereo vision, where, uh, except that you only have one camera and the other camera is replaced with some form of projector where you, you display a known structured light. In this case, it's a laser line, which you can kind of maybe barely see across there. And by extracting the location of that line in the view of the camera, you can again extract uh, depth information. And then down here on the bottom is a time of flight sensor. This one is made by a company called Mesa Imaging. And uh, essentially what these sensors do is they, they send out a pulse of light and measure the phase difference between the pulse going out and the return signal. And in doing so, you can effectively measure the time of flight or how long it takes for, for that light to return to the sensor. So all of these approaches have some problems with them, and uh, roboticists have been struggling with them for a long time. So for example, with stereo vision, if you don't have much texture in your image, like for example, if you were looking at a blank wall, you would, wouldn't get any information back because there's no way to correlate uh, those textureless views. And uh, time of flight sensors sometimes have problems on very shiny surfaces. You don't get a good return from them. In addition, most of these solutions are very expensive, um, tens of thousands of dollars, which makes them prohibitive for most manufacturing applications. So that was kind of the state of affairs for a number of years, early a decade or more, and then this happened. <laughs> so most of you probably recognize that. It's uh, Microsoft Xbox Connect. So Microsoft and a company called PrimeSense out of Israel collaborated or partnered to develop this device and essentially, it's a structured light sensor, similar to the other one that I showed you, um, except that there's a lot of engineering that went behind this thing to make it very high performance. So Microsoft had the idea of building this sensor and making it very cheap, and their goal behind it is to track human motion. But it's still a 3D sensing problem, just as roboticists have been trying to solve for a long time. Interestingly, though, Microsoft didn't really see that initially. They released this thing to the world as a game controller, and immediately roboticists jumped all over it, started hacking it, reverse engineered it, and Microsoft said, no, 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 please stop, stop. We're gonna sue you, our lawyers know who you are. But soon they, 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 they found the error in their way, and now they've, um, they've actually released SDKs, software development kits, around the Kinect, and they're supportive of using it in other applications. 
So why is this thing so interesting to roboticists? It provides high speed, basically real time, 30 frames per second, high resolution 3D data. And oh, by the way, it costs $150. So that is two orders of magnitude cheaper than any previous 3D sensor of that capability. So that's really a disruptive technology for a roboticist. So consequently, it's seen rapid ad in, uh, adoption, especially in the robotics research community. So up here on the top, you can see a, um, it's a, what's called a turtle bot. It's put out by a company called Willow Garage. Over here on the, on, the, on the right is some research that we're doing in using that uh, Kinect sensor uh, to drive uh, autonomous or uh, fully automated manipulation of objects. Um, down here you can see a, a quad rotor, uh, which has got an, a, a Kinect on top that's used for localization and mapping capabilities. So it's, it's really been a boon for the research robotics industry. Um, but we haven't seen much use in industrial settings yet. And uh, there's probably a number of reasons for that. Initially, Microsoft wasn't supportive of it, so you don't want to put it into some sort of manufacturing environment where you have to support it for years. That no longer is the case. So we're starting to look at using it. In fact, we've got multiple programs going on right now that are looking at using it in industrial applications. It really is a game changer for the robotics industry. I wanted to show you one application of it this is some research, again, coming out of Microsoft. This is out of their UK research lab. And it is being used now to build three-dimensional models of environments. So, <clears throat> The Kinect gives you a 3D map of the world. It gives you a single image. But what you'd really like to do is build up a full three-dimensional model of your world, sort of a static model. Essentially, what this thing is, is able to do with the, the, the Kinect and with these additional software implementations called Kinect Fusion, basically able to, to wave this um, the, the connect around and build up a full real-time three-dimensional model of your environment. It really is visually stunning. It's a capability that doesn't exist in any sense uh, today, uh, certainly not for real-time applications. You can kind of see snippets of it, but imagine being able to, wa to wave this connect around the room and build a map of the entire environment, including the people in, in it. Um, Really an incredible capability and uh, one that is going to change the game of roboticists, but also other applications. So imagine being um, going into a plant where you need to install new equipment and you need to map out that environment. Maybe you've got some as-built drawings, but you know they may or may not be accurate. So you pull out your tape measure, right? Start measuring piping, start measuring equipment layout. Well, instead of doing all that, imagine whipping out your Kinect and just waving it over this, this surface and being able to build up a 3D model that you can then pull into your CAD program. It's really revolutionary for a lot of different applications and it's gonna drive robotics in the future. Okay, so moving on to software systems. So I've, I've kind of classified uh, robotics software development in two different ways. So we've looked at industrial systems or industrial software development and the research robotics community. And these are two communities that are near and dear to me because I kind of straddle the line between them. So in industrial systems, you're dealing with um, sort of these proprietary environments which are provided by industrial robot vendors. These are people like FANUC and ABB and KUKA and there are a number of others. Um, and for doing uh, the tasks that those systems were designed for, that's fine, um, but if you want to extend the capabilities of those systems, it's very, very difficult because they are closed and they are proprietary and you really don't have access to the interfaces that you'd like to extend the systems. So for example, if I wanted to hook that connect up to a classical industrial robot controller, it just couldn't be done or not done for uh, any small amount of dollars. Um, 
So it's, it's been a very limiting situation and that has really hampered uh, in the research community in applying their methods to industrial robotics. On the other side, you've got the research robotics community. And here you have very custom systems, right? Very few um, research labs, and these are mostly academic labs, are doing work in industrial systems because they're closed and proprietary. So you have uh, many organizations, many universities who are developing custom hardware solutions and then building software stacks on top of them. And so while that's, that's an interesting and flexible solution, it does have some pro problems too. So the first is highlighted there, reinventing the wheel. So if you build new hardware, you've got to build the drivers and all the, the whole software stack that sits on top of that hardware. And that's a lot of engineering work to do that. And then maybe you spend 80% of your time between building the new hardware and building all this software on top of it. And then you get to spend 20% of the time doing the really novel research. That's a big problem in research robotics where it was until recently. The other problem with that is that um, you have the inability to compare results across uh, 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 different approaches. So let's say one organization is doing manipulation research and they've got some great new algorithm for path planning or grass planning or whatever it is. And you would like to validate those basic research results on another platform or maybe just have another organization validate those results. Very difficult to do if you don't have some common framework for doing that development. You basically have to reverse engineer the whole thing yourself. So it just wasn't done. So consequently, what that did is it meant that nobody really knew how well these kinds of uh, basic research and robotics worked in real world applications. So this was a real problem for industrial community as a whole for a long time. Both the, the, the proprietary and closed systems on the industrial robotics side, and then these very custom, but always unique systems on the robotics research side. And then came along a company called Willow Garage. So Willow Garage is a, a startup out of Silicon Valley. There are about 60 people, and they're independently funded uh, such that they have the ability to do bas basic robotics research. And their, their business model is somewhat unique. Um, they are focused on developing general robotics capabilities and technologies with the goal of, of generating spin-offs. So they realized these problems that I had on the previous slide were these, these either very proprietary systems or these, these wildly custom systems and said, we need a common framework for doing robotic systems development. And so they, they took some of the, uh, of the work that was going on at Stanford Research, or, or rather Stanford University, and built what's called the Robot Operating System, or ROS framework as they call it. So ROS is supported by Willow Garage, but it's an open source program. It's free, it's BSD licensed, which means that it can be used for proprietary or commercial purposes. And if you talk to the Willow Garage folks, they, de they describe it in, in, as kind of the, the combination of these four different capabilities or, or, or uh, aspects. So at the top left there, you have plumbing. And that's essentially the drivers. Right, that's what allows software to communicate with hardware systems and allows two different software systems to communicate with each other. So that's kind of the foundational stuff, the nuts and bolts that makes a robot work. Up here in the top right, you have tools. So robotic systems developers need specialized software tools for doing their software development. So these are things like simulation environments and visualization environments and graphing tools and uh, build tools, and all those are built into ROS. And then you also need capabilities. Capabilities. Um, so what Will Garage did is they looked out across the, the robotics community, and they basically took all these foundational capabilities in things like path planning, and grass planning, and navigation, and machine vision, and sensing and perception, and they built common frameworks, or common libraries, and rolled them into ROS. And then the last piece is this ecosystems. So not only did they make this, this open source and provide it to the world for free, they also support it. So they have things like wikis, they have um, online help, they have their own build system. So if, if, if you uh, release your own software, they will build it and index it for you so others can find it. 
So this sounds like a really great thing for the robotics research community, and it, and it has been. You can see it started in 2008 and has seen exponential growth in the robotics research community. To the, to the extent that now almost all, and that's maybe a little bit of a hyperbole, but most robotics research labs either are using ROS or they know about it. And this is really a game changer for the robotics research community because now you can share code, you can compare it, you can advance the state of the art without having to reverse engineer everything that came before you. It really is pushing robotics research forward. So over 3,000 software packages now which have been released under ROS. Really exponential growth. So what can you do with it? So this is a video that Will Garage put out, which is just a montage of, uh, of uh, systems and programs that are using ROS. Uh, and this is only after the first three years. There's many more after this. If you search, if you search YouTube, you'll, you'll find lots of videos like these out there too. Well, suffice to say, ROS runs on a lot of different hardware systems and does a lot of different things. It's running on underwater robots, it's running on aerial robots, it's running on ground robots. It's doing navigation, it's doing manipulation research, it's doing grasping research. It's literally been ported to just about every robotics research platform out there. So one of my favorite applications, and I'll, I'll, we'll see if this video works, is this one, which is towel folding. This was done at Berkeley, and uh, Mr. Singh was involved, at least this comes out of his lab, so he can probably tell you more about it than I can. It's a really, really hard problem for robotics. So you're dealing with deformable objects, which is incredibly difficult to sense. Humans do this naturally, robots not so well. This is the PR2 robot. It's built uh, by Will Garage. They gave out 11 of them to um, research labs around uh, the world. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, this one happens to be at Berkeley. So this is a combination of kind of everything that is built into ROS. There's perception, there's planning, there's task management, there's uh, visualization and simulation. Um, really incredible work. So I invite you to look on YouTube. You'll find many more. Search for PR2 or Ross. So the one thing you didn't see there was many industrial robots. Right? They were all kind of research grade robots or humanoid or um, lots of university research. And we at Southwest Research are involved in taking basic research and pushing it into application space. So we saw this lack of adoption of ROS within industry and commercial applications as a real opportunity. So about a year ago, we started collaborating with Willow Garage and started this program we're calling ROS Industrial, which is fairly descriptive, taking all the good stuff in ROS and trying to port it to industrial applications. So the first thing we need to do is build more or less hardware drivers so that you can um, take this whole ROS environment and get it to run on, on industrial robotic systems. And we've already done that, and now we're extending it. So we'd like to take it to things like uh, PLCs and industrial sensors. Uh, we'd like to um, uh, extend it to industrial protocols, uh, OPC, uh, network-based I.O., and those types of things. We're actually building a consortium around this idea to help develop and further uh, the technology and to build community around bringing ROS to industrial and commercial applications. So if anybody's interested in that work, please see me after the talk here and I'd be happy to, to discuss that. So the third topic is mobility. So there's been a lot of research in the last decade or more in mobile systems mobile robotics. 
A lot of that has been driven by uh, the Department of Defense. Um, but in reality, uh, a lot of it comes from the mobile industry. So your smartphone has a lot of the capabilities that are required to drive a robot. Right? So this thing's got GPS in it. It's got a low, low power, high performance uh, uh, processor. It's got an, an IMU, essentially, inertial system in it. It's got gyros. It's got cameras. It's got pretty much everything you need to, to build a robot. So that the mobile industry, mobile uh, communications industry, has really helped drive, drive mobile robotics because it's made a lot of those technologies better and cheaper. In, in addition, there's been a lot of great research. So I mentioned the DOD. The picture at the top there is the DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, it was first run in 2004. Nobody finished. 2005, Stanford. Uh, university finished first. That's their uh, Stanley vehicle. Drove 100, over 100 miles through desert terrain all by itself. Pretty amazing work. Um, in the middle there is an EOD robot. That's Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Uh, it's a pack, pack bot made by iRobot Corporation. Lots of uh, research has gone into making those things reliable and easy to use and they've saved hundreds of lives in, uh, in our uh, military hot zones. And one of the things that is probably most exciting to me is, is organizations like FIRST Robotics, which are bringing robotic development into high schools and now even into elementary schools. I think that bodes very well for uh, the future of robotics in the U.S. So these are just some applications that we're working on in the mobile space to kind of give you a flavor of what's possible and what's going on. And uh, uh, Mr. Singh, he'll, he'll show us some more exciting mobile systems here in a little bit. Um, this is a company called ICM, International Climbing Machines. We're partnering with them to, to develop payloads for inspection technologies. But they have a really unique technology, which is basically this climbing robot. It uses suction or vacuum to be able to climb s surfaces, even, even horizontal, vertical. can climb over rock, stucco, brick, steel. So there's a lot of interest in very large-scale applications or areas where it's uh, difficult to get human access, such as uh, wind turbine inspection. We're also extending mobile manipulation or industrial manipulation to the mobile space. So, um, so you know, most industrial manipulators are fixed uh, fixed-based manipulators, right? You bolt them to the ground. Well, that's okay if you're dealing with small objects that you want to manipulate. But when you start wanting to deal with like aerospace applications, which we do a lot of, you either have to build these really big robots like the one that I showed you at the very beginning, or you make them mobile. So take a small robot, put it on a mobile platform, and now you have a, a capability of managing a much larger workspace. We, this is some, some research that we're doing where we're tying an industrial manipulator, an industrial manipulator, a mobile platform, and a laser-based metrology system, tying those together uh, so that we can do large workspace, high accuracy manipulation. So rather than being able to just deal with things on the scale of meters, we're dealing with tens or hundreds of meters in scale. So we've also been partnering with the Electrical Power Research Institute, EPRI, um, to develop uh, inspection robots. So this one on the lower left here is a robot that's designed for inspection of power transmission lines. So this guy is designed to uh, traverse hundreds of miles a year and take various sensor data on, uh, on power transmission lines. So in the middle here is a picture of a, a LIDAR uh, sensor map. It's basically a three-dimensional map that's built up uh, around a transmission line. And that type of information is useful to get in. Basically, you can do things like change detection to see if there's been encroachment on the right-of-way for the, the transmission line. It also has cameras on board. It's got a weather station, GPS, obviously. Uh, it will have... Uh, uh, thermal sensors for doing various uh, types of inspection. Over here on the right is another uh, uh, 
inspection robot. This, this time it's designed for inspecting uh, the insulators. These are the, the things that connect the power transmission lines with the towers. And so in this case, you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of volts just feet away from the, the inspection locations. So it makes sense to have a robot in there doing that rather than having a human up there to do it. So this robot, all it does is climb up and down the, they call them sheds on the, the, the insulator and takes sensor readings as it, as it moves. Telepresence is another real hotbed in mobility research. So there's a number of startups and some well-established organizations that are developing systems like this. This is the Vigo. Um, it's a telepresence robot, if you will. It's, it's basically teleoperated and provides two-way voice and video communication. Um, companies like iRobot, who make that PackBot, which I showed you before, are developing these. Um, and there's there are several others. So this gives, it provides the capability of doing remote operations, right? So you could have, even in an office environment, you could have remote staff basically dial in using Skype or other uh, video communications. Or um, we have interest in it for supporting systems, remote systems, where you, it's not practical to have uh, staff there to maintain them all the time. Now, obviously, you're only going to get video data back. And what you'd really like to do is be able to manipulate that environment. Well. Commercially, that kind of capability isn't here yet, but uh, people are starting to think about it. Um, in fact, DARPA has a program which will start up next year, which they're calling Avatar. You can probably imagine where that's going. Um, so they have uh, grand visions of bringing this to the warfighter, which I guess is a good idea. Um, and as crazy as that may sound, there is a lot of really interesting work going on in sort of mobile manipulation. Um, I'm not going to promise that this video is going to play, but if it will. Hey, we got a little bit of it. This is Petman being developed by Boston Dynamics for the Army, being used to test um, chemical protection suits. So obviously, there's another environment where you don't want humans involved if you can avoid it. Um, so they're building up a robotic system. They're going to put these suits on the robot and then test them in chemical warfare environments, I guess. Anyways, uh, these are the people who brought you the big, do big dog robot, which probably many of you have seen. Uh, very popular on YouTube also. So this isn't going to be in your industrial environment tomorrow, but maybe in 10 years this kind of capability could be there, or maybe some variant of sort of what you see on the left there with a more mundane looking manipulator on it. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to touch on just a couple of topics in safety and regulations which are, are going to dramatically affect the robotics industry. So the first is in unmanned aerial systems. So today, uh, the FAA governs our national airspace in terms of saying who can fly and how they're going to fly and where they're going to fly. And it's very difficult to have an unmanned aerial system fly in US airspace today. It is done by some police agencies and some border patrol agencies. But uh, those are kind of special circumstances. Um, and just last month, the Congress uh, passed the FAA funding bill. And in that bill, was a requirement for the FAA to develop uh, regulations to allow unmanned aerial systems in, in the national airspace. So that's going to be a very big deal because now commercial operators will be able to fly these sort of unmanned systems similar to what's been flown in Afghanistan and Libya and other places. Um, but they'll be able to use them for commercial applications. So who knows where that's going to go, but obviously there are uh, applications in things like surveying and inspection and security, remote operations. And there's already some companies that are gearing up products around this idea. This company, Lehman Aviation, is uh, a French organization which is building systems specifically targeted at commercial applications. So this, this particular one, you can see it's kind of uh, able to be operated by a single operator. It's got um, autopilot, it's got GPS, it's got high-resolution camera. Basically, it goes out, surveys, um, 
surveys a site, is able to get georeferenced imagery, and then come back to the operator. So that is coming September 2015, I think, is when the regulations are mandated to be in effect. It may happen sooner than that. So it will impact um, a lot of commercial organizations, especially ones that deal with remote environments. And then finally, human-robot collaboration. So in industrial robotic applications today, they're basically governed by safety regulations, uh, which are promulgated, put out by the RIA, the Robotics Industries of America, and that's been adopted as an ANSI standard. And in that standard, it says essentially that robots will not interact with people because of the, the inherent safety concerns. So that standard's been in place since uh, 1999, and um, um, since then, there has been an ISO standard, which has been adopted in Europe and uh, much of the rest of the world, uh, which explicitly permits human-robot interaction with some constraints on speed and force to maintain certain levels of safety. But basically what has happened is that some of the software and the sensing systems have gotten to the point where they are reliable now enough to prevent or, or to allow human-robot interaction in a safe way. And so ISO is, has taken the lead on this, and this, this new standard which just came out or just got updated last year permits this kind of human-robot interaction. So why is that important? It's important because there's a whole class of problems that industrial robotic systems cannot solve today because the technology is not good enough. Because humans are so adept, they're so dexterous, they're smart, they're able to perceive their environment, and robots are pretty dumb and clumsy and not very dexterous. So you'd like the robot to do the things that it is good at, which is like high repeatability, high accuracy, high speed, high payload applications and let the human do the things that they're good at, like the dexterous stuff, the smart stuff, the things that take decent perception. So that, if you can combine those and create a collaborative environment where robots are working with humans, then you have the potential to tackle new problems that aren't solved today. And so the really exciting thing is the RIA, which is our governing body here in the U.S., is, is basically taking the ISO regulations and adapting them for use in North America. And in that regulation, there will be permissions or provisions for human-robot collaboration. And that's happening probably this year. They're already uh, in, in operation, and uh, they're expecting to have that released uh, this year. So that's going to take us one step closer, potentially, to having um, that sort of 1960s vision of, of uh, our Rosie the Robot uh, maid or servant in our household. Okay, thank you very much, Clay. Excellent presentation. Thank, thank you. you.